computer. Okay, great. So we've got Facebook Live going. we got recording going here. We're good. So my name's Kelvin Chin. Those of you who haven't met me before, um, and I, I run this monthly, I call it the 30th monthly Q&A session. So it's obviously every month, and it's on the 30th of every month, except February. Uh, but it's on the 30th of every month, just to keep it simple. And it's on at 12 Pacific time, 12 noon Pacific time, 3 o'clock Eastern time. And then you can figure out the time zones around the world. Andy, I don't know what time it is over where you are. Andy, are you in, are you in Dubai, Andy? That, that's where you are, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Andy's over in Dubai. People are all... 11 p.m. What's that? What time is it? 11 p.m. 11 p.m. Wow. Real trooper. Good to see you. Um, and this is an open forum about anything related to the afterlife, basically. Um, and um, today we got a special guest. We have my friend Sharon Coyle here with us. And it's Easter weekend, so I think it's appropriate that uh, we talk about a number of things as it relates to Easter, but one of the things, um, and again, we'll open this up to any questions that you may have. So some of you may have come with questions that, you know, we may not have gotten to in previous sessions and so forth. We'll open it up to our open forum um, in a little bit. But first, I'm going to uh, introduce Sharon to you and have Sharon, um, I'm not going to steal her thunder here. I want her to talk a little bit about something that's in a little bit of a different way. All right. So um, there is a theme that came out of the 30th November talk. If anybody is, if any of you seen that 30thnovember.com, which is, uh, you know, that uh, brief three hour, but still brief history of spirituality on planet Earth and the Judeo-Christian, Islamic, and Vedic traditions, those four major traditions on planet Earth, a uh, spiritual history that goes back about 10,000 years, okay? This is not, some of it's written, most of it's not written. So this was uh, a talk that uh, George, George Hammond gave um, and that I organized in 2014. One of the themes that we've talked about in this, this monthly 30th Q&A um, previously, some of you may have seen uh, my other friend, William Baldridge, uh, who had created some slides uh, on a number of previous month's sessions. By the way, you can look at previous month's sessions either on my YouTube channel. There's a playlist just for this, um, these monthly sessions, or you can go to my website kelvinchin.org and you'll find the page there and it has all the previous sessions for the last year and a half um, if you want to catch up. Um, but uh, William Baldridge put together some slides. We talked about cruelty in, in particular. We're going to talk about it a little bit differently today. Um, so uh, let me just introduce Sharon and say a couple of things about cruelty. First, Sharon has been um, a healer for many, many years. Um, she and I have memories that go back many, many years before that, let's just say. Um, and the notion of cruelty is something that's kind of well, personally uh, and historically personally uh, close to both of us. Um, what do I mean by cruelty? What did George mean by, what do we mean by cruelty when we talk about it in this context? Cruelty is behavior where the person who's being cruel is getting some enjoyment out of inflicting pain or suffering, either emotionally, physically, or mentally, or any combination thereof on somebody else. They're getting some happiness. It's, it's the unusual thing about cruelty, maybe it's not so unusual once I say it, but it'll make sense to you when I say it, is that the cruel person is being cruel for the same reason that all of us do anything, which is, I think, the pursuit of happiness. 
It's just that they have a warped way of getting their happiness. They're, they get their happiness by depressing other people around them and making other people around them feel really badly. Okay? So that's kind of an, in a nutshell. I didn't want to get into it in too much more detail than that because many of you have already read the cruelty essays that I've written in um, and the several cruelty essays in my second book, the Marcus Aurelius Updated book. And you've seen me give talks on this on my YouTube channel, et cetera, et cetera. So, but that's just enough to set the stage for Sharon. I'm going to give her the stage now for Sharon to kind of get into this in uh, a way that I think is really, really important, really valuable and underspoken, let's say, if that's even a word, <laughs> not spoken about enough. Hey, Sharon, thanks for joining us today. Thank you so much for having me on. Um, first and foremost, welcome everyone. Um, I'm not sure how familiar uh, you are with the 30th November and the talk uh, with 30th November. And um, I guess the the the, the team of, of Sil family that kind of has gotten together for many, 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 many lifetimes. And one of those goals were transcending cruelty. And we can see this. And if you have, you know, I highly recommend the three hours and watch it again and again and again. Um, I still need to watch it again and again and again, get something, you know, more from each time I watch it. Um, but that initial soul family and just kind of going through the gradation of the transcending cruelty and then kind of seeing how those patterns are coming up um, on a personal level and um, especially lately within the past year and um, sharing that information. So uh, one part of our soul family and Kelvin, you know, feel free to join in is, um, <clears throat> you know, getting together. And we see this with the Vedic and the Buddhist scriptures of ahimsa. Okay. The ahimsa, no harm, no harm to each other, no harm to even perhaps sometimes stepping on ants or, or, or no harm. Um, some listened, some didn't. <laughs> so, you know, came back again and said, hey, let's try this kind of, you know, Moses thing. And, you know, thou shalt not kill, right? That shalt not kill. And um, and, and then coming <laughs> off of a horrific day yesterday of of a horrific um, murder <laughs> on, on the cross, we could see how thou shalt not kill kind of came across in that. Uh, time period, which was really um, devastating, um, and then and the, then we get into um, Islam with the uh, female infanticide, and there's something in the Quran of you know, I mean, if if you had a female child instead of a male child um, in those days, you you buried the male chi uh, female child, so um, that was kind of outlawed. Um, we still see some of that today. Um, in China, right? Uh, Kelvin with the one child rule, unfortunately, um, not sure if that's still there. Um, so we, we try again and again to try and help, you know, transcending cruelty with um, different things. And, and some, some work, some, some don't. But I know that we spoke with, uh, you know, together um, on a frequent basis. And, and although it seems sometimes, especially in this day and age, that um, their cruelty is still so much alive and well and living everywhere. It has, uh, you know, curtailed with some of these um, document scriptures and, and contemplations. Correct, Kelvin? Yeah, I think that it kind of just to <laughs> sum up what Sharon's referring to re in regards to the 30th November talk. Uh, one of the underlying, I think I would say the main underlying objective of these spiritual leaders on the other side who've been, uh, the phrase George and I use is they've been like social scientists involved in helping, trying to help okay. humanity move forward in a less cruel way, to use the word that Sharon's been using and we've been using in, the, in this session so far, in a way that's not just sacrificing and killing babies and <clears throat> women and children very often and males as well. I mean, killing people sacrifice to the gods which has been something that's been going on for millions of years millions of years 
as long as humans been around and they start thinking about notions about God or God's plural or whatever, sacrifices, sacrif sacrificial killing. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of what Sharon's alluding to. That's been going on a long time in a long different, a lot of different cultures. And the bottom line is this group on the other side around 10,000 years ago said, enough is enough. Let's see what we can do to influence influence from a social again my term social science standpoint can we plant mm -hmm. some seeds and ideas in people's minds down on planet earth to try to move humanity forward in a less cruel sacrificing to divinity and gods and whoever our lives of other people so that's kind of what she, just a quick summary yeah <laughs> sure. yeah and, and i really like that you use that word sacri sacrificial sacrifice and sacrament and it has this notion of being a very spiritual thing a very divine thing to do so i'd like to also tiptoe into um sacrificial cruelty and um what does that look like you know um so so it came to me with Two things and two and let me know if this resonates and how this resonates with you or other people that you may know it may resonate with is um accepting cruel behavior from the notion of because in this lifetime we are blood family or we are tied or bonded together in something called marriage you know and so that would be okay because, you know, it, it, this is the person, this is my, my son, my daughter, my mother, my father, my husband, my wife. So therefore, this, this that sacrificial cru cruelty, would right? Be cruelty. Cru yeah, cruelty. Go ahead. Then cruelty becomes, it's not okay, but we take it as okay. We, it, there's two parts here, the receiving and the giving so the receiving of the cruelty well you know i we go into martyrdom right the more i receive of this well they are this this connection to me this blood family to me and therefore it would be cruel for me to not accept this cruel behavior there's something sacrificial and with the sacrificial part of it there's a martyrdom and with the martyrdom part of it there's some kind of reward in a, in a strange way. Okay. Does that make sense? Yep. Makes sense. Yeah. Okay. And the other part of it, the other piece of it, which is really important is that's the receiving, but also the flip side of the giving. If I'm cruel to this person and they tolerate it, then that is proving to me how much they love me if they don't walk away if they stay in a strange way we also hear this in phrases of we hurt the people we love the most we hurt the people we love we hurt the people we love even look at that phrase how about we love the people we love <laughs> how about we're kind to to the people we love and the first part um first and foremost with transcending this type of cruelty is acknowledging that that is cruelty. And I think sometimes that's a really hard light and flashlight to shine on because we have this um, unspoken rule. We don't talk about family, you know, and, and outwardly, right? Um, but the but There's even phrases for this, right? Skeletons in the closet. We don't bring those out. Um, and the other side is uh, there, there are blood, you know, there are blood. This has come to me in the past couple of weeks so significantly. And Kelvin said, hey, would you like to talk about this? And I didn't know what I was going to talk about. And I didn't know how I was going to talk about it. But two things came to me. Number one. Couple months ago, I was called into a different district. I'm there's five districts and in, in the place I work for. Um, and I was called into a different district because you know, uh, 
they needed someone who could sit at the bedside of a teen pediatric patient in hospice. I didn't know why I was being called to do so. That's not my normal job requirement. I'm usually on Zoom doing the after effects, the bereavement. But I said, okay, I'm being called to do this. Let me see what it's about, right? I felt such a connection with this girl who unfortunately passed this past Sunday. And I was talking to Kelvin and I said, Kelvin, and I have two sons and many lifetimes where I have a lot of sons, <laughs> right? Even George, George is my son in a different lifetime. And I said, I'm pretty sure this girl is my daughter. And, and Kelvin said, oh, I was waiting for you to figure that out, <laughs> right? And however, it was, it's soul family. It's soul family. And even though she, you know, um, sorry, end, end stage osteosarcoma, right? She had such grace, grace under extreme pain. And, and she let me in. She didn't let all her family in. She let me in, you know? And when I say she let me in, yes, she let me in the room. She let me into her room, but she let me in here. And she will always be a part of me. And she has always been a part of me, right? And I felt, wow, this is how that connection is. Mother-child connection, right? Then other things that has come up since then is, you know, uh, different connections that are there with blood family that don't feel so much as this soul family, a different connection. Um, and... I'm sure if you're here, you understand the the um that soul family versus blood family. But it came to me that, and I would love to hear your your takes on this, Kelvin and everyone, is if you ever had that feeling of soul family and the pressure of your blood family in this lifetime and kind of you, you know, okay, it's blood family. But if you think about it, we talk about energy cannot be created nor destroyed. When we, we ourselves are go to our different world or different missions or different place that we, you know, the other side or come back to this side, um, we're going to have different blood. I'm O negative this time around. Maybe I'll be a positive next time around, right? So that, that, that blood family we even have different blood in different lifetimes, right? Um, I find that very interesting of the, and I'm not saying that this is with every family, but how sometimes, you know, that we have that blood connection, how that in and of itself can reinforce and enable cruelty within families, whether that looks like emotional, mental um, incest, family incest, you know, talk about that, that's family, and you fill in the blanks. And I think it's okay, especially, okay, there's, you know, a child component, but when we're all adults, right, here in New Jersey, it's 18 or over, um, we have a choice. We have a choice there and a free will as well to transcend that cruelty. And so I guess I'm here today to say, it is okay. <laughs> I know there's estrangements. I know this isn't like a new thing, but there's the guilt that comes with that. And perhaps we may want to revisit why there's guilt with that, why we stepped away from certain people that may have been inadvertently or advertently abusing us. That's beautiful. Get away, Calvin. I think, I think. It's beautiful. I, beautifully said. I said what I used to say. <laughs> No, it's beautifully said. By the way, Sharon's a psychotherapist. She's also a bereavement expert and a grief expert. So she's has that um, professional uh, as well as her personal heart. You can tell is 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 fully involved in that as well. But she does have professional training and so forth and expertise in all those areas. Um, yeah, I mean the the notion that uh, blood is thicker than water. And that anybody can do That's anything. Another saying, right? That's the thing. You know, here I, I've heard that my whole life from different people. Blood is thicker than water. Really? Yeah. Um, 
in the and what do they mean by that for those of you who haven't heard that expression different parts of the world who may be watching this uh re recording later that, that that what that people that expression means is that it is that because we have the same dna meaning or we're same from the same uh, biological or marital family because it could be in-laws and so forth the blood is thicker than water means um that you protect the other person regardless of whatever their bad behavior is that's really what it means it doesn't i mean when people use that phrase they're not using the phrase when the person is angelic and really kind and genuine and giving Okay, that's just not when that phrase is used. The phrase is typically used in bad circumstances when somebody's done something really bad. And whether it's a to bad, cover to cover something with that might yeah. bring shame upon you upon know the, the family. family upon the family, yes. yeah. And the and the and, and and the concern is more for family unit and family reputation than whether or not the behavior was kind. And, and 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 inclusive and loving and whatever word you want yes. to you want to use to other people or not it's protect it's circle the wagons that's another one circle yes. the wagons right from the old so many phrases yeah surrounding this. the wagons from the 1800s circle the wagons because you're going to get attacked by other people so the family circles the wagons around itself to protect whoever has been in in the in the in the discussion we're talking about now yes the bad actor yes it enables this behavior that needs to be kept secret why would it need to be kept secret if it was that loving kindness compassionate behavior right that's the very interesting thing i see margot shaking her head yeah there's also a saying secrets make us sick what was secrets I saying? Make, Say again? Secrets make us sick. Secrets, secrets make us make sick. Us sick. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Margo, I, I'm just curious if you would like to come off mute and just uh, perhaps what was going on with you when you're shaking your head. Look oh, like it resonated with you. Well, um, it, it does because uh, a book club I belong to, um, there were, a book we read and you know, I can't remember the name of the book but it had a lot of family secrets and one of the things that we discussed was is it a good thing to keep secrets um especially you know if the intention or uh, is uh to protect and so on and so forth and um I just always feel like I'm out there and I want everybody else to be out there too without hiding or secrets or that's the way I feel so that's why I was nodding my head <laughs> yes yes and and Renee if you would like to come off me I really liked your uh what you typed with the family of origin versus mm. family of choice so if you'd like to come off me I would like if you can expand on that I really like that what you put mm. Yeah, I have been in many situations where just looking in someone's eyes, mm -hmm. I know family. Yes. And yet the family I was born into doesn't always feel like family. Mm -hmm. you know? I, I agree. Think, I think that we come based on the experiences that we need at this time. Not, you know, maybe another lifetime we had different purposes but in this lifetime it's almost like we came in for the opposite you know that we learn by opposite so oh, you're going to okay. teach me what I yes what I need to know about love by not receiving love you know mm. Mm. I, I have a I have a slightly different take on that here's another thing too I'm so I'm so sorry Calvin and then I I know you already go with this but I just yep. wanted to dro drop this for a second um, not drop this conversation, just a droplet of this for a second. Sometimes we recognize and have a recognition of someone from past lives 
and we feel the recognition, but we don't recall that it was a not so wonderful relationship, but it's a recognition. Yeah. So we say, oh my God, this person seems like my soulmate. They're my twin soul. I'm going, I'm going for it. Let's go to Las Vegas. Let's get married. Right. And all of a sudden it's what happened to that person? What happened to us? What happened to everything? Where did that go? It was a recognition, but the relationship, maybe not the most healthiest connection in lifetimes before. Yeah, that's, that's where it looks to go. Yeah. And yep. yet still, it teaches love and forgiveness. If it, that's the relationship that I'm to have, my takeaway is always going to be, how can this teach me love? And how can this teach me forgiveness? Yes. For, for myself. Love and, love and forgiveness for yourself, first and foremost. And love and forgiveness for the person from afar. Because that teaches that if you are going to keep doing lifetimes of that kind of love, and I just keep saying, well, it's, you know, um, this person to me, husband, wife, et cetera, et cetera, so on. And I just put up with it. And I just say, I'm going to, you know, be Mother Teresa, love and forgiveness, even though George tells me Mother Teresa wasn't, you know, a perfect state. No. Um, that's another story. <laughs> I can yeah. connect with her a lot. But um, what I'm trying to say is by tolerating that behavior in this lifetime, by saying, I'm going to be the martyr, I'm going... I'm not going to walk away. We we don't give them the opportunity to understand that other people aren't going to put up with that. <laughs> and, well, and we don't give them the opportunity to learn how to grow, you know. Walking walking away has never been a problem, you know, if you but you had to learn right. healthy boundaries. And you learn to healthy not. boundaries by right. experiencing again, this is not what I want. You know, yes. I learn what I want by experiencing what I don't want. And that's the polarity. Great. You know, so, so Renee, I this want to introduce I, an, want. I yes. want to introduce an idea to you here, and that's the one of choice. So yes, you're making a choice after the fact to learn mm -hmm. lessons from whatever is presented to you. But Sharon started touching on something which is very subtle, which is very, very important in my teaching, which is I teach all of you, my students, that we are making free will decisions all the time, including on the other side before we come in. And somebody may say, well, why would I make that decision to come into a family that's abusive or a relationship that was abusive? Sharon just gave you a very subtle reasoning for that, that we may not perceive on the other side. So what does that mean? In order to avoid a cruel situation that, yes, Renee, you're absolutely right. If you're in that situation on the back end, Monday morning quarterbacking, looking back at that, hindsight being 2020, let's learn from it. You know, let's make it an opportunity of learning. But what I'm suggesting and what Sharon was starting to suggest in her example was if can we discern a little bit more carefully before we made the decision to come in and have that relationship with the person that's possible now nobody's perfect about this stuff okay nobody we're talking about objectives goals approaches that can increase our happiness and decrease our suffering but nobody's going to have a life with zero suffering and 100% happiness all the time, okay? So we understand that. But that's a subtle discernment point that Sharon was mm. raising there, right? Very very challenging. <clears throat> salt, uh, salt and sugar yeah. look the same. Salt well, and think, sugar look the same. <laughs> I think there's also the, the other side of that. If you're predetermining where you're, where you're going to land, like if we have that choice, of selecting an ancestral line or a genealogy to land into. Sometimes it isn't about what they're going to teach you or what they're going to do for you. Sometimes it's what you're going to do for them. And mm -hmm. so many times um, we come for the ancestors, generations before us that we have worked with in other lifetimes that say, we want you here again, you know, mm -hmm. and 
by that choice, it's like, okay, what are the characteristics of being in this lineage that are going to be um, developed by me? I had a vision one time that for this very this very reason was like, why did I come to this family? And it was so simple. It was like, you know, I want to I want to walk away from this lifetime having developed characteristics that I feel are honorable because that's the level and nature mm -hmm. of my spirit. And those characteristics were all the things that Jesus had experienced when he was on you know, the planet Earth. And he didn't, I'm not saying he never had challenges, but there was a level of being able to rise above, to choose above. So if I want to develop a characteristic of, let's say, acceptance, then I may need to experience betrayal or rejection. And so I look at it as, a, a developmental timeline of still trying to stay in that honorable spiritual level, no matter what comes at me. And yet again, I didn't come for my parents or my family for what they could teach me. I came for what I could teach them. Hmm. Yeah, that's that's, a, that's, a, that's that's a beautiful way of looking at it, and it's it really it's is. one of it's one of a million ways we can look at all of these things. That's the thing that there is so many different ways. I mean, I'll give you an example personally that just came recently. Um, some of you heard the story in another group that I was in. I told you the story about my my father visiting my bro my son. I almost called him my brother, Sharon. My son, Jesse, <laughs> my father visited my son, Jesse, recently, a week ago. Okay, my father's been dead for 20, almost 25 years now. Um, to your point, Renee, previously, I thought, if you'd asked me, and this is in my third book about my past lives, I talk about this. The, the reason I thought that I came into this family, on in the 20, my 20th century family I'm talking about, right? My memories go back 6,000 years. I'm just talking about the 20th century family that Kelvin Chin, this person, came into this lifetime. I thought it was because of my mother. And I think as a big, it's, I think that's still accurate. I think it's a big driver was my mother and my connection with my mother from being my mother in, in, in other lifetimes and in particular one 1,000 years ago. That said... My father came and visited my son, who was my son in another lifetime in the 1800s. And while my son is driving down, driving on the highway in Los Angeles, California, my father <laughs> visited him and pointed out that he, my father, was also with us in that Lakota tribe in the 1800s. Now, I had, I had no knowledge of this uh, until my father son told me that he had this visitation my father who told him this my son i remember my son's name my son died when he was 14 15 years old he got shot right after i got shot um and i i know my son's name it's in my book um but he couldn't remember while his, my dad was visiting him in the car my my son was getting so emotional with the visitation that he couldn't remember his own name from the 1800s that my father was re referencing he pulled off at, at a highway in LA to a red light on the exit at the end of the exit ramp. And he's the first car. My son is the first car at the red light. And on the curb, right to the front right of his car, comes this huge black crow lens, a single black crow lens right there in the curb. And he's looking my son eyeball to eyeball, straight looking at him. And he remembered his name. His name was Crowfoot. That was the name of my son. So my father, I we think, said a crow down to remind him of what his name was when my father evidently news to me as of a week ago was part of that tribe i don't know what our relationship was but um but that's an example kind of what you're talking about renee it's like you know you get these different overlaps and this and that and this may have been you know uh, you know was i learning was i teaching uh, I, I think it was a little of both a lot of both going on there mm -hmm. in that relationship. Mm -hmm. This lifetime, talk about 20th century. 
you know, never mind other ones. But the overlap, there's a lot of different nuances to this that, that can come about through choices that we make. Mm -hmm. It's sharing. I agree. Yeah. I agree. I th think, you know, I a bit too was going back in time through a teepee. And I walked in the teepee. And then there was another entrance through the back. And I walked there. And the women were gathered around a ceremonial fire. And they were doing all kinds of healing and energy work. And in my curiosity, I said, wow, I, I want to work what you're doing. And they started laughing. And I was like, I don't understand why you're laughing at me, you know, because normally I'm expecting for somebody to say, yes, little one, come in and we'll teach you, you know. And they said, you're, you silly girl, you're the one who taught us. And mm. so these lifetimes are layered, you know, and Beautiful. these little love notes that say, ah, you know. Yeah, I, yes. I remember. Yes. I'm remembering in many ways. Yes. Yeah, yeah, it's very. And, and Renee, with that, the confidence of I have done this work before. Not only have we done this work before, but I have taught this work before. And the remembering of being fully who you are mm -hmm. that's the journey mm. how about other other comments from folks uh, uh it's kind of like the spiral of dna just mm -hmm. on that journey of, of a spiral mm. Mm -hmm. oh yes yeah steven do you have a Go ahead. So you unmuted. You... I'm just trying to place myself in other areas at the moment. I'm getting pretty lost. That's okay. Ask some questions. Ask questions. This is what this is, an open forum Q&A. So where are you lost? Tell me where you're lost and I'll help clarify. <clears throat> I think of late, I've been thinking a lot of a previous past and uh it's become clearer since my wife passed than it ever was mm -hmm. when I was with my wife. Uh, certain things in the, at the beginning of the French, Re French Revolution and then certainly things at the uh, latter part of the 18th century as well. And they've never been so clear to me as they've been in the past, but they weren't negative sort of feelings or, or as we're talking about today, it was more like, positive things that occurred yeah we're just talking about this notion of cruelty in, in yeah. but it doesn't apply to no i've had many 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 positive memories and so forth so don't 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 infer from what we're saying that no no no, <laughs> no, no. no, no this, was, this was just a mini topic right right me topic yeah go ahead tell us more steve well it seems like, I don't know if it's cruelty or just an unhappy ending occurs when I've had these good things. Like part of the journey that I'm in goes well for one person, but bad for the other. And I don't know what that was. And I always thought it was more of a protectionism, but not something else. Mm -hmm. I have never had this like negative thought. Uh, I, I mean, of late, when I dream in the morning, I have these other occurrences uh, in the 20th century that I never had, especially uh, I see myself as a surgeon in the First World War, uh, wow. not accomplishing what I wanted to accomplish. Like there were so many things that had to be done so quickly and so often that uh, uh, it overwhelmed me, the triage aspect of it. And I've seen that in, in this present life as well, where I've had to triage and usually I made the right decision about how to triage, but I think that was based on experiences I, I had as a, as a surgeon in the German army during the uh, First World War. Mm. Very strange. Yeah, that makes sense. That makes sense to me. We learn through our millions and trillions of experiences in our many, many, many lifetimes. And 
whether we realize it or not, we are learning. And even whether some people are there, it's kind of un, it, it, unintentionally learning. In other words, they're learning through experience. And sometimes we're learning bad habits through experience too. But in your case, you learned something that was helpful, right? I think, sounds like. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. You know, if we're not, if we're not, I don't know. This is the way I look at my life. You know, I can only speak to my about myself. Is I, I, I'm like you, Renee. I choose to learn about from uh, from experiences, whatever, however they. And I can't. You can't always. You cannot always figure out like why did that happen? You know, like I, I had a long mm. hour talk with somebody earlier today, privately on the phone, and all these really unpleasant, unfortunate things including accidents and all kinds of stuff has happened to this woman and you know there's there's not a lot of you can't always explain things away you cannot but but can we take from them and glean something that's useful for us going forward to me that's the cup half full right Renee so um no that's that's beautiful Steve yeah no Lots of experiences from the past. I have beautiful experiences in the past, memories and so forth, um, with my children, with a lot of the, my close friends and so forth. My children this lifetime, who were, have been my children in other lifetimes, and also my daughter this lifetime was my sister, my older sister. And the, I think I've mentioned. I don't know if I've mentioned that to you, Steve, in in the lifetime that you and I may have at least temporarily overlapped. I'm not sure if we personally overlapped in the 18th century, but my my sister, I mean, my daughter <laughs> was my sister then. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Calvin, if I just, um, just for those who have not seen the 30th November, I think it's just maybe interesting to recap that um, Calvin's best friend, brother in another lifetime literally figuratively all every of um had some message on the 30th on the 30th of november right and so on the 30th of each month kelvin kind of holds these and to sometimes touch upon points that were in that um talk mission etc cetera, etc cetera, so forth one of those was transcending cruelty. Another one is um, love, you know, loving someone for who they are, not for who we wish for them to be. Um, so this was just a mini, this was a uh, mini talk on this topic. And back to uh, whatever you want to talk about, Cal and everyone, if you want to talk about your past lives um, or or other things or meditation or, or whatnot. Yeah, yeah free, this was free just realm here. <laughs> thanks, thanks for giving context there, Sharon. Yeah, this was just a mini talk uh, of that topic, one of the 20 topics out of that talk, Steve. Yeah. That's what this was today. And I asked Sharon to join us because she had a different take on this, what I'm calling the blood is, th you know, th you know, the, you know, blood is thicker than water. Well, I call that a myth in my book. Um that uh, that that is an absolute rule across the board. No, it it, it can be used as an excuse. Um, do I feel close to family? Yes. Um, do I hold anybody, including my family, accountable for their actions? Yes. <laughs> They're not mutually exclusive, right? And they don't give an excuse either way. That's my point on what Sharon was talking about. But yeah, no, this is generally about afterlife, anything related to the afterlife. And I've expanded, to, to Sharon's point, I've expanded these monthly sessions to call, talk about anything, that even, even stuff that was not talked about on that 30th November talk in 2014, given by George, George Hammond, who was my brother 2,000 years ago, and we were friends 4,000 years ago. So we have independent memories, and we've connected the dots and so forth and so on. So I've had a number of those memories with a number of people, including Sharon uh, and others um, in our other lifetimes together. Um, Sharon and I've been together more than once. So at least we remember anyway, more than once. Who knows how many, many more than once's. But Steve, I don't know. I don't want to put you totally on the spot, Steve, but do you want to share anything more about what you started to 
with other people who, because, you know, I've heard you talk about it in other groups, but a lot of these people, have they've seen you for the first time here. Uh, it's up to you. What would you like me to, what part of me would you like me to talk about again? I, 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 I think the, the museum and thing. Steve, I have to tell you, I know you resonate with that 17th, 18th, and now I'm hearing, oh, look, balloons. <laughs> I was supposed to turn that off. I, I, I would be open to going even further back. I'm feeling even further back with you. But yes, please. The um, what you were saying about what was it? the uh, the friend the the museum that that was wild. That was a uh, wild. Okay, uh, start I with the go. museum, and then if you want to go farther back, like Sharon's suggesting, but start with the museum story. That was pretty okay. Cool. Uh, in the uh, 1980s, I was leaving Europe, and uh, I thought my both my parents were going to take a trip with me, but ended up with just my father. And we were traveling for six weeks all across Europe. We started literally in the uh, Spanish Peninsula, ended up in Berlin. But on one of our days, uh, we got to Paris much, much later in the morning than expected and missed a train. And... Uh, when I'm in Paris, I tend to go to the museums, and my favorite museum is, without doubt, the, the Louvre. I don't know what attracts me to that museum, but it attracts me very, very profoundly. Uh, I was in the museum with my father. We weren't with a group. We were sort of just going to areas that I wanted to see, not the Mona Lisa or not any of the things that most people go to. And I happened to walk into a room with my father and there was a group there and with one of the tour people going over a painting or whatever happened. Uh, I just realized that this person was giving the wrong explanation for the painting, but it wasn't just the recognition. I suddenly went into extremely fluid French explaining that no, this painting was not from 1727. It was actually from 1724. It was of uh, the Marquis de Lafayette before he went to the U.S. in 1725 for his final tour of the country 50 years after the revolution. What was striking to me about this was that after I spewed all this French out, and I was never formally educated in French in any way, shape, or form, Another curator came up and said uh, to me and that other person, you know, we, we've been trying to verify this piece of work for a while. We had suspicions that it might have been earlier than we thought. We had suspicions of what could have been later. But this person verifies almost to the T exactly what that was, when it was done, why it was done. And it was actually a gift to Lafayette before he went to back to the United States in 1725. My father was just struck like he'd been hit by a bolt of lightning. He couldn't believe that I had suddenly stopped this group, politely interrupted, and then gave this florid explanation of what that work actually was and where it was from. And then to have another third party come up and verify that yeah, this was true, but as quickly as the French came over me, it left me, which startled everyone that was around me. And uh, that that was really a profound day for me and for everyone was there. I never expected to happen. I never expected to be in the Louvre that day in the least, let alone in that room with that group and with that person. So, yeah, it was it was kind of a very emotional but very striking day for me. Clearly to me. Amazing. <laughs> right? Was, Nothing planned. Wasn't yeah, planning no, on being no, there. And, definitely wow. not. That's definitely a past life of knowledge in your memory banks coming through in the 1980s in the Louvre at that moment. It's, it, to me, that's such a clear example of, of what people conjecture and sometimes talk about. Yeah. There's no other explanation. Yeah, the detail and the fact that you didn't know French. No, but as I think Sharon knows, because of late, I've been able to open up one-to-one -one with her 
uh, which I haven't been able to do with anyone for quite some time. And I remember very, very, very distinctly of the fall of the realm of Louis and Marie Antoinette at the beginning of the French Revolution, uh, how drastically and how terrible things were. But what I profoundly remember most was that, uh, and it seems that my life is either passed as a combatant or passed as a physician. I seem to alternate them one after another in my, what I'm recalling now. But at any rate, I was asked to escort a carriage out of Paris and securely get someone to Normandy where they could get on a boat and get over to England and be safe. Hmm. That in itself is not too striking, but uh, in my life with my wife, uh, I never had a nickname for any of my other people I ever knew in my life, but I called my wife Delphine all the time. Now, Delphine in French is a referral to the reign of Louis and Marie Antoinette and anybody that was associated with that. And she responded rather profoundly that she could remember that event as well. And I felt really, really good because in the event, I, I got her out of just turmoil in Paris and hundreds of miles to Normandy to get her to a safe place where she eventually got to England. Mm -hmm. But I also know within that event that uh, my outcome was not that good <laughs> because I was uh, cavalier, a, a knight of the realm. And so, you know, events caught up with us and uh, I didn't exit the way she did. But yeah. she remembered that point. Yeah, I'll make... our... Go ahead. Oh. No, no, I, I was going to say through our 40 years of marriage, uh, we would have that, we'd wake up with the, like, that exact dream at the same time at night. And uh, I'm pretty sure we were speaking English. I don't think we were speaking French, but I don't remember even at that, at that point. But yeah. That's pretty profound. And the connection between you and your wife is also noteworthy and profound, the connection of the souls there that as Sharon kind of alluded to earlier, there's a there's a memory there. And whether the memory is explicit or more subconscious or a little bit more subtle, it, it can come in all different forms. Sometimes it, it's, it's very, it becomes, it rises to the surface. Sometimes it doesn't, you know? Yeah. And the other comment I want to make, you said something at the beginning. I thought I heard you say, Steve, and I want to comment on this. In terms of your past life memories kind of coming in, like one comes and the other comes, and I can't remember the phrase you used, but some, it can kind of go back and forth, I think, is what you were implying. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah. So, so um, the analogy that I use in my book uh, on my past lives is a jigsaw puzzle analogy. And, and um, what you've described so far, and maybe you have more than these but let's just talk about the two that you've mentioned I, I in my jigsaw puzzle analogy i described that as steve with steve having two jigsaw puzzles going on at the same it, it, memories of ju two jigsaw puzzles so the a lifetime let's just give me this i'll give you the specific jigsaw puzzle analogy first and then i'll apply it so the jigsaw puzzle analogy is simply that our lifetime is like a jigsaw puzzle with a hundred million or a hundred billion pieces or something, a lot, many pieces. We don't know how many, it doesn't matter. But each piece is like a piece of an experience. And, um, you know, if those of you have ever done a jigsaw puzzle, those of you who have not done a jigsaw puzzle before, sometimes they have like lots and lots of pieces. You know, like I remember when, when uh, I was little and my brothers were, or they're much younger than I am, but we had these jigsaw puzzles uh, little wooden jigsaw puzzles with like six or seven pieces. You know, they're just, those are pretty easy to put together, right? But if you ever had a jigsaw puzzle with 500 or 1,000 or 1,500 pieces, I I think they even have jigsaw puzzles with 2,000 pieces. Uh, I've seen 1,500. They must have 2,000, whatever, some of them. And they come in a big box. And on the box cover is the picture, typically, of what the jigsaw puzzle is going to look like if you get it done, right? You put together all 1,500 or 2,000 pieces. And some of the pieces, and the pieces are little, you know, they're like this, you got 2,000 little pieces like that. And, and some of them look very similar to each other, by, both in color and sometimes in shape, but they may not actually go together. And then you get the ones that really go together. Oh, wow, the color and the shape goes together. You know, sometimes the shapes go together, but the color doesn't. So they clearly they're not the right pieces. 
together. My, my analogy is that our recovery of past life memories is very similar. And you may get like two or three pieces that go together or experiences that kind of, or pieces of an experience that kind of fit together. Or you may get six or eight or 20 pieces, but you may get 50 pieces. Oh my God, you get 50 pieces that go together and it kind of really pulls together and a, and a, a, you know, a piece of an event that you can actually remember a lot about but 50 pieces out of 100 million it's this tiny eensy tiny fraction you know and to me it's like what you're describing is you don't just have one puzzle going on you got a couple and then you're getting pieces from that one and then now you're getting pieces from this one and i've had as many as i can't remember exactly but somewhere six to eight lifetimes going on at the same time with puzzle pieces be you know coming up resurfacing in my consciousness and sometimes I went, is that one go with this lifetime or does that go with that? Because the experience was very similar. I was eating. It was something, you know, like something that was not really time specific or unique to any particular lifetime. It was kind of some of some of my, my memories are very mundane. Well, I was around a campfire. Well, I've been around a campfire a whole bunch of times in a bunch of lifetimes. Which one's that with, you know, go with? And so that's the uh, that's a vision and a, a visible uh image that i wanted to try to share with you and everybody yeah. I, I think i'm sort of caught between uh guardian versus protector when when i'm the guardian it's like i'm the doctor when i'm the protector i'm like the military person and it seems to be various militaries but uh, the guardian part seems to have been overwhelmingly more important than the protector part That's if that makes sense. it totally makes sense and this goes to what i talk about in my third book this one you haven't know that the you just look at the color of the book cover this one my my my, my past life book i talk about ex exactly what you're talking about which i phrase in my book i call them personality traits you're talking about personality trait about yourself guardian protector but how does that manifest how does it express itself in one's series of lifetimes it may express itself very differently at different times right like sometimes i've been a military leader sometimes i've been a spiritual leader sometimes i've been just a teacher sometimes i've been a monk and just gone very much inside other times i've been a monk a buddhist monk and and, and I was more external in terms of my teaching. So there's qualities, I think, at least in my experience and some of my, uh, many of my clients who I've talked with who have had memories and friends and so forth, that we carry these traits that we carry from lifetime to lifetime, but how they express may be quite different in a different, in, in various lifetimes. That makes sense. Yeah. You know, I have a musical trait. This lifetime, I, I I played as a musician when I was younger. I played a lot of music when I was younger. Um, there are other lifetimes where I was composing music and playing, but composing. Uh, I'm not. I didn't. I didn't express it that way this this time. You know. But there's a trait there. Yeah. Other questions? Anything else? Other folks? Please open up. Feel free. Share. Yeah, I have a question. Yeah, Andy. Go ahead, Andy. <clears throat> Do we actually learn anything? Is there a lot of conscious... Um, is there some sort of awareness retained? to make a choice that I want to learn this, or most of it is happening by mostly impulses, desires, and things that we're not pretty much in control of. So who's the we? Who's the we in the question, Andy? Um, no, I mean, previously in the talk, someone mentioned that I chose this life as yeah. if to learn to receive or to give love or whatever. Yes. Do we actually learn anything in these shifts? Well, 
I, the answer I would give is it depends. We, we it depends hope so. <laughs> we well, hope so. We we hope so, but we it depends <laughs> on the person. How you just all you, you to answer your question, Andy? You look around. You look around, and I know you don't know eight billion people, but you know more than the people on this call, and you know, you know more than your small group of friends. And I'm not saying I don't know how big your group of friends is, Andy, but you know, you're a small group of a thousand friends. I'm joking, Andy, but anyway, you know what I mean. You you have a you have a group, and you know them, but and you look around, and you can guess, you can conjecture. We don't know, you know, people really well, but what would you say? Are people learning when you look at the new when you look at history, how, uh, how uh, you, you read history? Do you see repeats of errors people making? Yeah, I do. And, and but do I see progress? Yeah, I see progress. When I look historically, I think the problem is today. I was just talking with a group about this the other day. Uh, and, and the problem is, is that we. Um, we look at this CNN 24, 24 hour news cycle and we incorrectly infer from that that the world is much worse off than it was 5, 10, 50, 100, 150, 500 years ago. No, it, no, it isn't. It's much better. Now, I'm not saying that there's not room for There's huge room for improvement still. Right. Otherwise, why, why would I do what I do? So I do it because it makes me happy, but I do it to help the world and help other people because there's huge room for improvement. But it's, it, is it better? Yeah. I mean, not that long ago, you look back two or three, four hundred years ago, not that long ago, one out of five people died a violent death. I mean, violent. You go to the local tavern and you come back and you, you don't come back. Yeah, because somebody stick, stuck a fork in your in your eyeball, in your brain, and because they got drunk and they got mad at you because the way you looked at them. Th does that happen sometimes today? Yes, but not. It's much less than 1% violent death. And, and, and they know this from looking at bones and so forth in cemeteries, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You know, um, you, you look at, you know, uh, what what was the... What was the the infant mortality rate in ancient Rome when I was there 2000 years ago? It was, you know, 30, 30 percent, 30, 35 percent mortality rate. You know, most most children never made it. They never made it to, to 10 years old. Sharon, you want to comment? Go ahead. I do. And and it, thanks, Cal. Um, coming back to our our friends words. Um, do, do we learn for perhaps for those who have ears to hear? Right. Perhaps for those who have ears to hear, those who have eyes to see memories, memories of our good friend, you know, so many thousands of years ago, especially on this weekend. Um, do we change? Is it just Groundhog Day again and again and again? I think honestly, um, from my experience, because I only could speak to my experience only, I think that's why it was so important to kind of share that transcending cruelty. Um, from my earliest, earliest, earliest memories, which go way, way, way back, you know, um, hey, we need you. We need you to do this, this mission. We need you to do this mission where you're going to, you know, some, some years you lose your children, lose their life in childbirth. Um, starve, you know, uh, be kicked out of your home, go to a desert, talking about past lives here. And why I did it because of someone who asked me to do it and who I loved very much, who I call father. Okay. Cause that's how much I love him and he loves me. And in this lifetime, and Calvin knows where I'm going with this, he has taught me that and apologized for those missions and for me not of course to be confused of cruelty means love you know um that he was sorry sorry he came through to george and um and kelvin as well and so yeah i'm learning after thousands and thousands of thousands of years that cruelty um harshness martyrdom does not necessarily mean equal love 
nor does a soul need to go and do that to prove love. Yeah. So I think that's, um, I don't know, Calvin, what do you think? I'm just speaking from my heart here. And no, I don't know if it's going to, you know, so, some may be confused. What is she talking about? No, um, but hopefully, Andy, that I think you may resonate with that. Yeah. Okay. Does that help, Andy? It's beautiful what you're saying, Sharon, because it goes to the heart. This is why we're using the word cruelty instead of good and evil. There is, there's no good and evil forces in the world. There's, there's, there's choices that people make that are bad. We'll call them cruel. And there are other choices people make that we'll just call kind and loving and helpful. Helpful, not hurtful. There's hurtful and then there's helpful if you just want to be very simple about it and not no spiritual jargon. And it, and, and to me, it's an, it, I'm trying to help teach people that it is in fact their best interest to be more helpful than hurtful. That hurtful person surrounds me. Yeah, it makes the bully feel better to make belittle people. It makes them, you know, it's short term, makes them feel better. Oh yeah, depress everybody around. I feel better. I feel more powerful. But their inner confidence is lacking, and that's why they do that. So to me, I understand that it's a long-term project, mm. you know, to, to for that person to make that choice. But I'm here to educate people who are more, let's say, closer to the you know the desire to make a choice as opposed to people who think, no, it's great. I'm going to step all over everybody and it's working and just shut up. Mm. So I'm not going to, that's not my target audience. My target audience is the people who are open to change. Some people are not. So that goes to your question, Andy, you know, is everybody is, is here to learn? Well, I, I, I think everybody can learn and everybody's experience teaches them stuff you call that learning, right? But does it teach them good stuff? Does it reinforce? Because the bully is learning from people who cower. Do you call uh -huh. that education? The bully makes people cower and feel afraid. The bully is learning that that works. But but the bully is not completing that education process. I, I use the phrase completing in a, in a, in a relative word way, not absolute but does not take that education process far enough, is maybe a better way of saying it, to see that he or she is surrounding himself with a credible universe of miserable people. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so do, and, they... and that's where we have the control over the transcending cruelty. Yes. So Andy, perhaps, and, and I know Steve spoke about, I'm a protector, I'm a guardian. My role again and again and again was the martyr. My role was a martyr. My role was to take all of that in, all of the trauma in. And now I feel like, okay, I'm a little bit released from this role and I feel I feel really light. I feel really good. <laughs> um, so I'm looking forward, you know, if if and when my time comes to go to the other side and and if I come back to not be in that role, <laughs> you know? Yeah. That's pretty cool. Yeah, that's pretty cool. So I get you see what I mean. And Andy? by the way, when and Jesus, you know, he has been back before, but I don't think he'll come back. As a yeah, Jesus has been back. Before. He might just come back as a musician. I don't know. No. Yeah, Jesus. Be done was, with the clergy. Jesus was abused very severely. That's the holiday yesterday. They call it Good Friday. It was Bad Friday for those of us who were there. So I don't know. Yeah. What, Good Friday. Yeah, that killed me. Good Friday. What was good about it? Yeah, I know. <laughs> I know. The, uh, I will go to Renee in a second. Um, a Andy, did, did, did is there any anything more in terms of follow up before I go to Renee? Thank you. That was good. Oh, okay. <clears throat> good. Okay, Renee. Yeah. Yeah, about you know, in transcending cruelty, that that topic is really an interesting look um i think and going back to you know are we learning anything mm. i think on a physiological level are we're laying down new neural pathways neuroplasticity so we we are 
learning on a physiological level how to place that information, right? Emotionally, we have to kind of learn how to respond to it. Does it does it serve a purpose or is it something we don't want? Um, mentally, you know, we have to choose and there's also accountability for our choices. One of the things that um, has kind of helped me with the whole karmic look is that we make a lot of choices uh, knowingly and unknowingly. You know, that that phrase in and of itself steers me back to I'm human, I'm fallible, but my knowingness helps me to be more accountable for the choices that I'm making. And if I'm more accountable, then I'm going to be more purposeful and mindful. And that's learning, you know, just how to even survive in the world and navigate with billions of personalities. So I, I think we're always learning, um, but we get to choose what we're learning. And then we get to act upon that and be accountable for our actions. Karmically, I feel like I've made a lot of mistakes and I've made a lot of probably hurt people, you know, knowingly and unknowingly, trying to make reprimand for the things that I do know about. But I think, again, going back to that love and forgiveness, I think forgiveness kind of cancels out that karmic wheel if we are truly able to be accountable for how we forgive. And that starts with ourself. That there just kind of, you know, puts it back into perspective. So. Well, I, I have a... Um, uh, an First, Raquel, I love what Renee just said. I do. And I, I, I love that you also brought up before that intergenerational because looking back and the neural pathways and the neuroplasticity looking back on my mother and my mother's mother and her mother before they all kind of had that martyrdom do you see and I, I really feel that I'm kind of taking these shackles off for future generations or for generations past. It, it's really yeah. a, a wonderful thing. Well, because get, why? Because you're, be not gonna be, you're not going to be. I'm sorry, Renee, what did you say? I said, you get to be the pattern breaker. You know, you. Oh, you that, it's hard, but, yeah. but amazing, right? It's a calling, you know, and you get to actually understand. I mean, my Native American heritage drove me forward by just saying, whatever you heal within yourself, Renee, you get to heal seven generations backwards and seven generations forward. And the loving person that I am, the nurturing person that I am, wow. who does not want to help make your posterity's life easier? You know, and I see my children, my pre-therapy babies, I call them, had a bit more struggle, you know, with learning on their own how to do uh, this evolution of mankind. Whereas my post-therapy babies, seem to glide you know because so much work had already been done for them that's not to say they won't have their own issues to heal but it's made a difference wow thanks so for here, sharing that thank you so here's the thing so my takeaway on what you just said is the the patterns we're talking about are created by what they're created by our choices that we're making. So these you're talking about choices and perspectives that you have. And what Andy was asking about was, does everybody have, I'm, I'm reframing what you said, Andy, but he was kind of implying, does everybody have that perspective and take those, make those choices? The answer is no, they don't. You look around yourself, not everybody is viewing the world the way you do, Renee, or the way I do, or Andy or Sharon. Not everybody does. And so the patterns uh, are controlled not by something external to us, but they are controlled by us. This is a fundamental teaching point of the transcending cruelty talk that George could only talk about for about five minutes because he ran out of time and that he and I are been expanding on since that talk they are made fundamentally by free will choices that each of us are making so 
yes, there may be patterns that ripple out, but they are patterns that are caused by free will choices that each individual mind is making to, to adopt a certain way of thinking or not adopt a certain way of thinking and perspective and so forth. And by doing that, demonstrating to others, and in that way, in a sense, teaching them through their demonstration. Not everybody views themselves as teachers, but people in, inherently teach through demonstration. And by demonstrating in a way, I'm not saying this is you, Renee, I'm just talking about humanity. So by demonstrating in a way that sometimes is cognitively dissonant, then that creates a teaching, an education that teaches bad behavior, bottom line. It's what we're talking about in terms of cruelty, hurtful stuff, okay? So what we're saying in the transcending cruelty material is to be more discerning and conscious about one's choices. So you, I'm reframing something that you said that, I think is really important because you're talking really about being conscious and and making conscious decisions. That's kind of what you were, that's what you were saying. I, I, you didn't use that word, but that's what you were saying. And I agree with that. It's really important, Not, but not everybody is. A, a lot of people are making decisions that just are opportunistic and they're kind of bouncing around. And that is due, due to a, la a, a lack of ability to, have discernment and so forth in any given situation. So that's what that's what um, I teach is how do we filter and how do we discern, you know, for those who are open to discernment. But not everybody is, to, to your point, Andy. Not everybody is. And, and, and that is their free will choice. And so another fundamental part of the transcending cruelty teaching is to accept people to Sharon quoted the, the the this memory that and Jesus has asked me to bring this out many times now about his definition of love that has been gone forgotten. Love is accepting the other person, including yourself, for who they are, not who you wish they were. That's a free will that's that's full of free will teaching that we, allow others to be who they are that means people who don't want to really learn about stuff and don't want to be conscious and don't want to be self-aware we need to allow that too that's the thing i agree I, I agree and i i really feel like that's the purpose of being on a planet with billions of people yep that's a great learning that's the that's the sandbox we're, we're all playing in some are going to share their toys some are going to throw sand how can you still enjoy playing in the sandbox with or find the person that's sitting by themselves, you know, or just enjoy building your own sandcastle? I mean, it's it's so conscious, but at the same time, everybody's playing a part. I love the analogy of a play. And maybe in one lifetime, I came as the antagonist, which is why I know how to be cruel. Maybe another time I came as the protagonist, which had to learn to surmount the antagonist in order to find my own happiness. It's like we all get to be these bit players at different times and in different lifetimes, but we can accept within that, that all of those are purposeful and meaningful and they're all needed. They're all needed to make the play happen. Thank you. Other questions, comments, other topics, anybody want to weave in? Because again, yeah. open forum. Any questions? Anything? Yes, it's Daisy. Hi, Kelvin. Yes. Hi. Um, okay, you know, I'm in, I'm a baby in this afterlife stuff. So it's all pretty been pretty deep and pretty interesting. But here's my thing. I'm a Catholic and last night I watched, you know, it was Good Friday yesterday, and of course I honor that. Um, so I watched the Passion of the Christ movie last night. It was made by Mel Gibson and when he was interviewed, he said he made the movie as close as possible, according to scripture and research. Mm -hmm. So when Jesus uh, was being whipped and 
suffered all that. So all that's for real. So my question is, those Roman soldiers were so cool. So cool. So did Jesus and the Roman soldiers agree to to play those roles in that lifetime? No. Or were those choices for a punch choices. pilot? Or? The notion that the notion that people are in a play and and given roles to play in a play that we call life is mm -hmm. is is not accurate. We can have we can we are always continually making choices. You can have a soul plan and come in and say, okay, we're gonna I, I want to have this kind of relationship with you. And people can figuratively speaking might say, well, I kind of have this role in this relationship. Okay, figuratively speaking. But nothing, it's not literal. People might use that phrase. And, but you can come in with in a, with a soul plan, and the soul plan may not work because of choices people make. Not just the people in this in the planning. Have you ever you ever tried building a house? Or I, I used to do mediations of con, big, huge construction projects where there's electricians, plumbers. Uh, there's the you know the the you know the, the you know the 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 you know the the people who lay the foundation. There's all these people involved all these contractors involved and and everybody agrees beforehand that this is the budget and this is the timeline and this is when you're going to come in and do this and it never works it never works exactly according to the plan that's the way life is any soul <clears throat> is fraught with other people's decisions the weather affects <laughs> things and you, you people don't control the weather you know, mm -hmm. I, I, I've been in tribes where we used to do dances and so forth, mm -hmm. try to create what rain and so forth and try to dance to the, to the rain gods and so forth. It's like, no, you cannot control everything all the time. So the notion that everything is predetermined is, is, is not accurate. Everybody can make free will choices. Free will just means, can you decide to do something and, or decide to do the opposite? Yes. If that, that's what choice means. So, um, kill, look, uh, kill, kill, kill or be killed, kill or be killed. That's it. Simple. Let me make, let me give a very, kill or be killed. Yeah. I whip Jesus or I will be killed and my family will be killed. I'm the judge of no one. You know, I was never in that situation to make that decision. Now you're talking about, you're talking about the Roman soldiers now. They were ordered to yeah. do that. So Sharon. Kill or said, be killed. Kill or be killed. That's your choice. Yeah. And so like, that's your choice. That's a tough choice. People, so those kinds of things. Here's the thing. I use this example for people. Sometimes people will argue that no, everything is predetermined. Everything is already set out. Every there's no choice that we're all in what they call a simulation. There are huge podcast podcasts with millions of people who believe that they're in a simulation, that they're a puppet in a simulation. And I say, well, and, and many of them are Christian. And I say, well, you know the story and we can talk about it because it's Easter Sunday right now and yesterday was bad Friday. And <laughs> do you are you telling me that if you believe that everything is predetermined, that Jesus, John the Baptist, Jehovah, and a whole bunch of us decided on the other side this soul plan to come down and 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 for Jesus to be John Baptist to be beheaded and Jesus to be crucified and killed that's the christian story which is false who mm -hmm. would do that so i was asked recently on a podcast uh what was what was what bothered jesus and jehovah the most i said well it's this notion that Jesus died on the cross to save everybody from their sins. Jehovah, that's anathema to Jehovah and Jesus, who are so close like father and son, not biological father and son, obviously, but the relationship between the two souls is so close that really, I'm going to send my son down, who I love more than anybody, and I am going to make him suffer, be scourged, and and nail to a cross and suffer and physically die because of everybody else the notion that 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 this crucifixion notion and saving of sins notion 
is the reason it works so well is it because it puts people, individuals who believe that at the center of the universe. God loves me more than even Jesus. Look what he did to Jesus. It's yeah. it's really upsetting to both of them, I can tell you, from many, many Yeah. Years. I, I attended the other night. I forgot what that meeting was called. But when you said that, that Jesus pissed off because he was, he wants people to stop believing that, that he died for our sins when it's not true. But here we are as Catholics glorifying that. And it's so I guess it's a limiting belief for me because that's the way I was raised. And, you know, crosses all over the house with Jesus and hanging. And I don't look at that as well, now I'm looking at it differently. I didn't look at it as being cruel before. Right. Because I believe that he was doing it for God, for uh, for us to save us from our sins, from eternal death. That, that's the belief. Uh, that, if, if you read the history books, the religious historians, I'll get to you and Sharon in a minute. If you really re religious historians to tell you that it's it's very clear that Paul started that myth. Yeah. And there were others. There was Ju Justin the Martyr. There's Tertullian. Over the next 150 to 200 years, there were others who contributed to what later mm -hmm. became what we know today as Roman Catholicism. Ro right. So there were yeah. many. There were many actors that added in, but Paul's the one who started it, and he told us that he wasn't. He told us he was going to stop. We 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 brought him to a meeting in Jerusalem, and we had it out with him, and he and he lied, and I'm sure he's avoiding me if he's anywhere on planet. <laughs> but anyway, so but but you don't have to on a personal level, Daisy. You do not have to change yeah. your beliefs if you really are comfortable with your Roman Catholic beliefs. Nobody, including Jesus and Jehovah, is is leaning on you to change your beliefs. You have your own beliefs. And whatever works mm -hmm. for you, and, and I say this to all my students, you've heard me say mm -hmm. this many times, mm -hmm. you have to figure things out for yourself. That's what self-development, that's what personal self-development means. It's personal. And so, right? right? Mm -hmm. I have yeah. another question. I'm in Bible yeah. study. And right now, this year, with VSAB, they do a study of a book, one of the Bible books from September to May. So we're about to wrap up the study of John, the gospel. Mm -hmm. So I just learned Monday night, that's our study, study night, that um, this came from the leader. And we we're going through that particular chapter that the cross wasn't really that high up, was not really that tall for Jesus, that it was like shorter. And I can't believe that. <laughs> What's the point, though? Like the, 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 with the cross, the cross that say, oh, he's way up high and he's looking up in heaven. And, and then that he's like at eye level right there. And then they're, they're doing all these things around him. The Roman soldiers are gambling, you know, who's going to get his clothes and Mary Magdalene and Mary and the other Mary's there. And, they're, and they have like a personal view of him. And, and I don't know. It's hard for me to picture that. It's just well, really hard. First of all, first of all, um, it was very bloody. Basically, <laughs> they're basing that on what? There's, there's no the Bible. There's no video. There's no photographs. There's no, and the well, the Bible was written. You know, when the first you talk about the New Testament. First of all, when you say, right. that. and yeah. then, and then the, the the one that was written the soonest after Jesus died was at forty five to fifty five years after he died, Matthew. Mm -hmm was written 125 years after he died. So that's like, mm -hmm. Daisy, that's the equivalent accuracy. Mm -hmm. okay, that's why I asked you who's saying this. You know, that that's the equivalent accuracy of somebody dying in 1900, and now you're writing about them. Who, who are you interviewing? Wow. It's, you're interviewing their grandchildren, yeah. great, great grandchildren, because, you know, if they died in 1900, that means they were born in around 1870. Jesus was around 30, 33, right? So he's born in 1870. Who are you talking to who was there in 1870 or 1900 who's still alive today? Right. 125 years old, 140 years old, or 150, 60 years old. 
You're talking to their great, great, great grandchildren. And remember, nothing was written down then, Daisy. It, yeah. it, any, it, the historians will tell you anywhere from one to 15% of the population was <laughs> illiterate. Mm -hmm. To 15% of the population was literate. 85 to 99% of the population was illiterate. Okay. So it's all yeah. verbal. And so if you ever played the game in kindergarten where you tell a story in a circle and 25 kids and you, you and you and you whisper it and then you hear it what you what you started the story of 25 kids and it's nothing mm -hmm. like what you started it that story is all right. Distorted, right but if you if you're looking over 50 to 125 years you're talking about probably a hundred thousand stories going around before somebody wrote it down right yeah mm -hmm. so in, yeah who, who knows well, how old it was and what difference does it make? But Sharon, you, 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 you know, I mean, I don't know what the preacher was making. Just, a point. A, Go ahead, Sharon. just wanted to touch upon two things and then um, maybe this will wrap up with the transcendent cruelty. Yeah. But number one, um, you know, I've had many people, I, I work in hospice, um, lost a 16 year old right on Sunday. Uh, her mother just cleared out her whole room, right? Um, she did not save her soiled sheets. She did not save her bloody pillows. Um, and I think I can attest. <laughs> uh, yeah. I, don't, I, I mean, if, even if you hear well, these stories, Mary Magdalene wants the bloody clothes. They're flight, fighting over the well, bloody clothes. Not, I don't want the bloody clothes. I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm think gonna about be, your loved ones. Think about your loved ones. What kind of pictures do you want of them? Do you want pictures of them on their deathbed, on their crucifix, or do you want pictures of them in 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 a, I don't know in, in 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 just their normal life? You know, do you want to save when you really when you go and your loved ones die? Do you go? Oh, I'm smelling the T-shirt of my son or daughter or father or mother, and this is the one where they look so lovely. Or are you saving the ones that are bloodied and soiled with, you know, their excrements and saying this is the one I want? I mean, it just doesn't even make sense. It doesn't make bloody sense <laughs> to my English, uh, you know, compatriots. Are. The other thing is um, that whole notion, the whole notion of dying on the cross for all of the sins goes against of every single project, whether it's, you know, project Buddhism, project uh, Mohammedism, project, you know, Moses, pro it goes against every other single project, which is what? Transcending cruelty, curtailing cruelty. If you have someone dying on the cross for all of your sins, then you can go out just like our lovely, you know, I'm New Jersey, New Jersey mobsters and go out and shoot people up and go, hey, I shot someone the other day, do 10 Hail Marys and you're good. This is, <laughs> this goes against everything. It enables cruel behavior. That's all I got for today. But thank you so much. I hope that makes sense. Does yeah. it make sense in the historical, you know, it, historical projects or religions of the past? It does not. Yep. Yeah. It yeah. does not. Really good points. Really good points. People using it as an excuse. Yeah. No, 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 no. To your point about the crosses, I, I'm not sure, Daisy, if you've listened to the 30th of November talk, but yeah, I'm starting to. I just yeah, listen to it something, something that Jesus, <laughs> something that Jesus asked us to put in, and George and I said, no, we're not putting that in the talk. Was that Jesus was asking that we talk about people taking down their crucifixes. Imagine the uproar that would have created in this public lecture to thousands and thousands of people if that had gotten out. So I'm saying this privately to small groups now because he wants to still say it, but we did, we said, yeah. no, we're not gonna say that. We don't want to be crucified again this time. Uh, by yeah. saying that to people. So, but it was an example of what Sharon was talking about. That's how that's how um, Jesus views every time he sees a cross of himself around mm -hmm. the world bleeding. That was not a pleasant experience for him. It's not about what Paul created, this that notion of dying on the cross for his sins. But 
Yeah. And I believe George said if, you know, if you are partial to the cross, <laughs> and I am mm-hmm. as well, um, to not have the one with Jesus. On. <laughs> you know, there are there are crosses without, you know, uh, without the blood, the body, the bloody body on it. <laughs> yes. Without the bloody body. Yeah. Yeah. OK. All right. Uh, thank you, Kelvin. But I want to say one thing to Sharon. Sharon, um, I lost my son on Thanksgiving Day 2019. Six months later, I, I lost my husband. I'm a widow. And um, I did I did save their clothes. I did save my son's last clothes that he wore. And I did smell all his clothes because in the closet. I would cry into his clothes because that's the memory I want to have for him. I don't do it anymore, but I did when I, uh, my first year, my raw grief, um, and oh, yeah. other mothers will do that too. I mean, I belong to a few Facebook groups for mothers who've lost a child. I'm sorry, but this is, this yeah. is emotional for me. No, no, Where no, no, they they Daisy, Daisy. Hand. Keep, they keep, the keep, keep the everything. Child drink. Yes, yes, uh, of keep course, everything. Of course, nobody's going to feel different. And uh, every everything. mother does this. Every mother does this every mother because losing a child is so different than losing your parents which i've lost three brothers which i've lost and then my husband a child is very very different part yes, of your flesh, yes yes absolutely of your heart. I, i'm I in the bereavement business keep everything <clears throat> I, I didn't mean that i meant i'm not so sure i haven't heard maybe <sighs> maybe you know if people stay the excrements yeah. in the clothes. Do you see what I mean by that? Yeah, that's what I know. I'm You're saying. Trying to make a point. Everything. Save everything. Yeah. And I am so very mm-hmm. sorry. I can't even imagine. You know, I do have, by the way, a loss of a child group. Um, free, mm-hmm. free, free. It's starting um April 10th mm-hmm. on Zoom. You're more than welcome to come into it. Um, there's unfortunately six or seven members and growing. That's great. You can send me a, t- a text or a Facebook Absolutely. Message. Absolutely. Thank you. So, it. You so those that's my two cents worth. <laughs> well, thank you for sharing, Daisy. Yeah, our heart goes out to you. Yeah, Sharon was talking about um, using an example that was analogous to what Jesus was talking about in terms of the bloody, him on the bloody cross. She was not talking about tossing out, you know, everything. That, that's not what she was referring to. So, yeah. Um, anything else before we call it a day? As I know we try to keep it to an hour and a half, but thank you so much, um, Renee and Margo and Daisy and Andy and uh, Steve and everybody who was, uh, and anybody else who I didn't mention, and of course, Sharon for being our special guest today. Thank you so much. Really appreciate everybody's con- contribution. And, you know, everybody's figuring this all out. You know, there's no like one answer to everything. You know, it's everybody has a different perspective. And that's what I keep r- reminding everybody and myself about that, that just we all have a different view and everybody's view uh, needs to be respected. That's what free will means. Even the view of somebody you really disagree with. It's it, it, it. That's the problem I think in the world today is that we've gotten so uh, siloed is the word. We've gotten so tribal siloed in thinking that uh, acceptance of other views that don't exactly fit the way we think as an individual or a group are considered heretical. That's like ridiculous. You know, we live, as Renee said, on a planet with 8 billion people and the diversity, to her point, Renee, I'm paraphrasing, but, you know, the diversity of views and the diversity of choices that people make is, to me, what makes it an interesting place to live. It'd be incredibly boring if everybody did exactly what I did. (laughs) I don't want it to. I I need diversity. But the hurtful part is the part to just bring it home today to the theme that Sharon kicked it off with today. The hurtful part is the part that we're trying to lower, reduce, because that really works against actually the self-interest of even the bully, but they don't realize it. 
So again, that's that that's the uh, kind of the takeaway from today's session. And of course, we covered a lot of different stuff, in past lives and different things and so forth as well. Thank you so much for everyone being here. So we'll see you 30th next month, and we'll see what we end up going into next month. You know, thanks, everybody. You take care. Hey, Kel. Yes. Thank you. Good night. You Our can problem. see I'm you can see I'm really bundled up. Yeah. Two days ago, I got my last COVID booster. Mm. I picked someone up at the airport a quarter after nine, nine hours after I got that booster shot. And I came home and she was sitting here next to me watching the TV. And I said, Oh, I felt this before. I'm having a reaction to the COVID shot. Within three minutes, I did not have control of my body. Wow. Like having a stroke. So my hands were going like this and I couldn't stop them. Wow. And I told her, I said, you're going to have to turn off the TV because I, I tried to pick up the mouse and I couldn't do it. Wow. So I've been in bed for yesterday. I was up a total of two hours. And then today I got up in time to watch this. Wow. Now, when this is over, because I want your permission to, before I tell her, it's about your personality trait. What's that? The sitting bull. Oh, well, you want to share something now, you mean, before we go? Well, I guess I will. First of all, everybody, I've known Kelvin since we were four years old. So we have a long history. Sitting bull was being interviewed with... Buffalo Bill Cody when they had the Wild West show and the Catholic Church was one of the entities that were backing this and they asked Sitting Bull well now that you've been to all these cities what's your takeaway what's the thing that you like the most and they were hoping he was going to say well lanterns are better than campfires or the trains are absolutely amazing. Or these wooden buildings are better than teepees. What he came up with, he said, the thing that I liked the best was the dancing fan fan girls. My God, they were incredible. <laughs> and That's Cal. Said, oh, no. <laughs> oh, no. Uh, anyway. I thought you were going to say candy, but anyway. <laughs> well, Calvin's always been popular with the ladies. That's why I brought that up. <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> uh, anyway, great to see everybody. I'm glad you're feeling better. I'm glad you recovered, man. Boy, oof. I didn't you know, know about that. I'm wow. not going to get another shot because I was thinking as it was happening, I've never lost control of my body before. Not ever. Wow. And that could make you have a heart attack or a stroke or whatever. Mm. I said, so it's just not worth it. You know, I, I only get to shop because I, I'm a musician and I have gigs and I, I'm around a lot of people, but I'm, I'm gonna take my chances from now on. Yeah, well, glad you're okay, man. Good Thanks. to see you. All right, take care everybody. We'll see you, see you in a month. Take care. Thanks for coming.